Good morning, Real Life Ministries, and thank you so much for joining us online. We hope that you are having a fabulous May. I cannot believe that we are getting towards the end of May already, but I am looking forward to summer and some warm weather, at least up here in North Idaho. Uh, my name is Sarah Short. I'm a part of our groups team here at Real Life. I would love to know where you're watching from. You can drop that in the chat. We've got staff and volunteers online ready to answer any questions you might have, help you get connected. So again, you can interact with us all throughout the service. They are there to help you in any way that you might need. You can also email us at info at reallifeministries.com. Again, if you have questions, um, prayer requests, those can be done there as well. Also, don't forget, if you're new, download our Real Life Ministries app. It is the best way to stay connected all throughout the week. It's got uh, our sermon series, past sermon series, a place to give, a list of all of our upcoming events that you will want to know about. So make sure um, that that's downloaded on whatever device that you might have before we get started this morning. Also, we're still focusing on sending a kid to camp. We talked about it last week, but I don't know if you grew up going to camp, but I did, and it was so powerful and so encouraging for my walk with the Lord personally. And we wanna be reaching our students all of the time. And we don't wanna tell a kid that they can't come to camp. We want them to be in healthy relationships with other adults, a time to worship, to hear great messages, and just really experience the love of Jesus. And so we would love it if you could partner with us, you can go to our website, reallifeministries.com backslash send a kid to camp, and you can donate there. Again, we don't wanna tell any kid that they can't come to camp. And this year we're doing something cool. We actually have 12th, 11th and 12th grade camp, 9th and 10th grade camp, kids camp, which is fourth and fifth grade, then seventh and eighth grade and sixth grade. So we've got a ton of camps happening. And not only can you send a kid to camp, but if you're interested in volunteering and you thought, man, I could sit with one of these students and just share what Jesus has done in your own life, you can actually volunteer as well. So check out the website for all of those details because we're gonna have a ton of kids and we're gonna need help both financially and with volunteers. So again, we would love for you to partner with us in that. This morning, Bill Krause, though, is bringing us the message. We are in our series, The Origins. Again, we're talking about the early church and the design of what the early church looked like and how do we live that out in today's culture, which can be very difficult. But we want to go back to the roots, back to what God specifically designed. So I cannot wait to hear his message. I hope you're excited. Again, if you have questions or anything like that, we want to help you get connected. Drop all of those in the chat, and we will see you guys later. Good morning, church family. It is so good to be together again. Would you guys stand with us right now? We're going to open our time with prayer and and singing to our Lord to to praise him, to worship him together as we do each week. But right now, let's, let's go to God collectively. God, we come to you this morning to, to set aside the worries of this world 
and to simultaneously say thank you, to pour out our thankfulness, to enter your courts with thanksgiving, for you are good, the sacrifice, sacrifice that you made on our behalf, we can't even fully understand, but Jesus, we say thank you, we raise a hallelujah in this place. Jesus, we love you, we acknowledge you together, and we celebrate your name, and all God's people said, amen. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My
say thank you. We say hallelujah for you are good. You're the one that we're counting on. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails. You won't fail me now. You won't fail me now. Cause in the waiting. Yeah, the same God who's never late. Is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will. I'll sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Come on, let's declare that again. I count on one thing. Well, the same God who never fails, you will not fail me now. No, you won't fail me now. Cause in the waiting, well, the same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. some enthusiasm up front. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? You doing good? You awake? It's nice to warm out. They got to sleep in. They sure did. Yeah, they did. Hey, my name is Chris. This is Sarah. Uh, we have the privilege of serving on staff here on the groups team and uh, super excited to be your host today. And we honestly can't wait for what God has in store. It's going to be great. No, it's my favorite day of the week. We love getting to gather and worship together. Are you guys excited about that today? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, hey, we uh, do this every weekend, but we would love to know that you're here. Uh, and one easy way to do that is by texting in uh, here to the number on the screen. This is uh, one way that as a staff, we can provide our life group leaders and our pastors uh, just another layer of care for the people in this church. We really care about you and 
uh, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, care for each other. And so uh, right now, if everybody will pull out your phone, this is one moment of a loud texting. Actually, I haven't done mine yet this morning. So I'll do it with you. Let's text here to the number on the screen. And if you're joining us online, shout out to you. You can text online. Also, pro tip, you can save it in your phone. Mine is called Real Life Attendance, and it just happened. There we go. Also, I would love as a whole church, can we give it up for all of our, our new people, our first time guests? We, we're so excited that you're here. And we want you to know uh, there's space for you at this church. Uh, we, we know that it can feel a little bit intimidating coming in for the first time uh, with people you don't know. And uh, we just want you to feel welcome here. And this is an incredible group of people and uh, there's a place for you. And so if you would text new to the number on the screen, we would love to connect with you and kind of help you find your bearings and talk about uh, where to go from here because uh, there's a lot to be explored at this church and as you're living out this uh, faith in Jesus. And we also have an opportunity to connect today. So as you leave today, you'll see people with lanyards on. They'll either be red or black. Talk to any one of them and just say, hey, I'm new here and we would love to welcome you in. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It is awesome. Also, if you don't know, we have a Real Life Ministries app. It is the best way to stay connected. Nobody your ever best claps resource. for the app. I know. You know. We're really proud of our app. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So, Apps but you need guys, love this too. is it has a list of all of our events, um, what's going on, our past sermon series, our current sermon series, a place to give. If you make a decision, you can do that right on the app. So make sure that's just downloaded and ready to go before we get started. Yeah. And as we just continue on in our service, we're gonna carve out a little bit of time to worship God through our giving and uh, something that we get to really buy into and invest in the kingdom of God, not only what he's doing all over the world, but as he continues to grow us as well uh, through that step of obedience. You'll see on the screen some of the ways you can participate, our website or the app, or you'll see boxes around campus that you can use. But uh, this is just a really special way to be a part of what God's doing. He's doing some cool things. Uh, also, you guys, summer is just around the corner. I am very excited for summer to be here. And that also means that summer camps are just beyond the horizon. And who grew up going to camp? Did anyone grow up going to camp? I grew up going to camp and it was a life-changing experience yeah. for me. I think for you as well, you said. And oh, so, yeah. um, and so we want to send as many kids that, as we can to camp. We want them to get to experience real relationship, the truth of God's word, be invest, invested in by other adults. And so we're doing a send a kid to camp big push right now. And so we're trying to send over 250 kids, but we want to sponsor at least 250 kids to go. We do not want to tell a kid you cannot go because they cannot financially afford that. And so we're at 12%. So we've got a little bit more to go. So our youth team and our kids team will be out in the lobby at the kiosk, you can stop by and talk with them and they will get that all set up for you. But what an incredible way just to bless our community and the youth and just the next generation. It's amazing, isn't that cool? What a great thing we get to be a part of. We also wanna celebrate one more thing and I hope we'll do this justice. Just this last week alone, 10 people in our church made the decision to get baptized. How cool is that? Man. This picture in Romans 6, it gives us that we're dying to ourselves and we're identifying with the death of Jesus as we go in the water. And as they come out, they're walking in newness of life. And every single one of these people has a story and a legacy that God is writing and a trajectory that has been shifted forever. And it's a beautiful thing that we get to be a part of as a church. Um, and today we get to continue on in our origin series. Uh, Jim Putman and Keith Strasberg are bringing the word. So I'd love to just pray together uh, over them and over this time as we dive into that. Lord, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful for what happens in your presence. And uh, we know that you are going to speak. And so I pray you would give us ears to hear uh, and feet to walk out truly what you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. Uh, and we ask you to have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Look at all of you people who came on a sunny day. I just would like it to be sunny on a day I don't work. That would be really, really good. 
No, I, uh, I am so glad to see all of you. Um, it, it, listen, I'm just telling all of you who are new, it's still a trick. It gets warm one day, you're like, it's over. Oh, no. <laughs> just wait. Don't get your hopes up. Uh, take it when you can get it. Well, we're in a series right now called Origins, and um, we've been walking through a, a, really a series built on saying to all of us who have been a part of this church for however many years, and all of you who are uh, moving to the area and contemplating whether you want to be a part of this church, here's what we're saying in this, in this series, big picture. We're going to stick to God's word. We're going to stick to the, the historical meanings and the, uh, the, the doctrine given by the first church, no matter what the rest of the culture does. Wow. And so we want you to know that from the beginning, you know, 20 years ago, 24 years ago, when we created our membership class and our key doctrines and all the stuff that you got to do to start a church, we didn't put in the doctrines 20 some years ago that um, marriage was between a man and a woman. The reason we didn't put it in there is because it, it wasn't even an issue back then. Nobody thought about that. Of course that's true. It's never been anything other than that for the history of mankind. We would have never thought, but about 10 years ago, we had to redefine marriage. We didn't put that there were only two genders. Because four years ago, there was only two genders. The culture is moving. And uh, what we did say 20 some years ago is that what most people think of as church is not really historical church. From the very beginning we've said, we are about making disciples not converts because Jesus told us to go into the world and make disciples, not converts. And discipleship entails, uh, Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So um, we knew we were supposed to make disciples, not converts, and, and, and there was the baptism part, which really speaks of the, the public statement, I am a Christ follower. It's a picture of dying to the old life, being raised to walk in newness of life, a different way of living, born again. It's a picture of all that. But the teaching part we've always done the way Jesus did it. Uh, that's been our emphasis. Yes, we have weekend services, um, big groups, and Jesus spoke to big groups. Um, but Jesus also met his disciples in relationship and walked through relationship with them. So our way of making disciples has always been, what did the first church do? We, we've called that process of disciple making the SCMD process. Uh, as you follow the New Testament, uh, the, both the book of uh, Acts and, and the way the disciples did it, and again, they got that from Jesus. They just did what Jesus told them to do. Uh, the SCMD process has been Jesus shared his life, came down from heaven, shared his life, and then shared the truth, God's truth, the gospel, the truth, why he came, what he was about. Those who accepted the message, he invited into connection, share, connect. In connection, he took people as they were, uh, kind of selfish and, and only looking at things from the human perspective and uh, you know, somewhat divisive and, and in many cases very divisive and uh, you know, people that just didn't live for God because they didn't understand all that. He took those people in connection and started to move them towards his way of seeing themselves and others. They, he started to move them from consumers, SC, consumers, to ministers, SCM. In fact, that's how we, we came up with the title of the church. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says that we have been reconciled to God through Christ, and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We implore you or we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So we are ministers of reconciliation with God and one another. Love God, love others. All these scriptures are about relationship with God and others. So ministers of reconciliation. Share, connect, minister. And then finally, 
after Jesus had, had shared and connected and trained them, he sent them out to make disciples. D, share, connect, minister, disciple. And the early church did the exact same thing. They followed that model. Why? Because when Jesus said, go make disciples, he didn't mean go do it any way you want. He meant go do what I did. So they did. They shared the truth. Acts 2, verse 38. Verse 36 says, this Jesus whom you, both, you, whom you crucified was both Lord and Christ. When the, per, when the people heard that, they were pierced to the heart and said, brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, so you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then, if you get into verse 41, which is kind of our text, 41 through 47, that we've been bouncing off of, 3,000 people were baptized, were obedient to what Jesus had said and what the disciples had been told to say, and then it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Remember, Jesus had told them, go in the world, make disciples, baptizing, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So the early church, uh, you see them teaching and, and the people were devoted to the apostles teaching they they listened they became disciples of the apostles teaching and they were devoted to fellowship there's connect they got together in the temple courts big group just like jesus had done big groups small groups from house to house daily and then they started to minister they started to fellowship they would share their time. They would connect, right? And they, were, and they started to sell their possessions and goods to give to whoever had need. You see this transformation in connection from consumers to now they were selling things to give to people in ministry. They were ministering both to the, to the saved and to the lost. And then as time went on, they started to collect their bigger giving. As the group grew, they were able to do some things together that they weren't able to do as individuals. There were some things they could do as individuals that they couldn't do in a big group. They were sharing their faith with their neighbors and their kids and all that. That's, that's small group. That's, that's individual. But they also collected money to take care of the Greek widows in the area. They started to develop ways to reach people in bigger ways that you couldn't do individually. So they ministered individually and corporately. Well, if you follow the book of Acts, now you know that Paul gets involved. He was Saul at the time. They changed his name to Paul. He starts a persecution, and the church was spread out from all of Jerusalem. And wherever these people went, they went and shared the truth. They connected in relationship. They started teaching people to become ministers. And then they sent out people. And what you see is this D happening wherever they work, lived, and played. See, as a church, we want to follow the, the model of the, of the early church in their mission, in the way they did things, in the attitudes, in the definitions of words. A church isn't just something you go to. It was a collection of disciples who came together to encourage one another. They gave to one another. They supported one another. And they also, they also together took on this mission of reaching the whole world for Jesus one person at a time. Because that's why God waits to return. He wishes none to be lost. And we are the light, the city on a hill that he put out on the, on the mountains of, of a dark world to say, here is a place that speaks the gospel, lives out the gospel, has the values of God that brings the message to the whole world because the time is short. So often we as Christians allow the world to redefine the church and, and, and we just narrow it down, dumb it down, dumb it down until we look the same as everybody else. We spend most of our time the same way everybody else does. We pursue the same things everybody else does, but we go to church every once in a while and we think that was what the church was 2,000 years ago. It's become that, but that's never what it was. And when, when Jesus comes back to judge our behaviors and our actions, he's going to judge it according to his word, not to the dumbed down, watered down version that we're handing around these days. So the question is, are you a Christian? 
Are you a disciple? Are you part of a church? Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a part of a church. And so what we're saying to our people, this is where we've been. God has done a miraculous thing here. And for those of you who are new, we want you to come on in. But when you come on in, you're coming on in by Jesus' terms, not by yours. And for those of you, there's a, listen, people uh, drift easily. We have people that have been here for years, but they drift. And so uh, their desires and their wants and their preferences start to take over. And, and then they start judging the church based on their preferences. And I'm saying to you, we're not changing to chase around all these people's different preferences. We're going to stay the course. So SCMD is what we have taught for 20 some years and God's done miraculous things and, and over that time many people have been raised up. We've planted many churches, we have staff around the world and what I'm here today to do with Keith is first of all to announce to you that Keith, uh, we're going to put some flesh on the SCMD process because it's happening here for us and Keith is a product of that process but Keith and Christine uh, are now, they li now live in Lexington, Nebraska, and Keith is now the new senior pastor of Parkview Church in Lexington, Nebraska. Now, let me, let me say this. First of all, I love this, and I hate this. Uh, many of my best friends are around the country now that were raised up from here. Brandon Gindin and you know, and some are closer, Richie Shaw and some of the folks that are, you know, that they're all over. So I hate that uh, Keith, who's been one of my best friends for 20 years, is um, going. But I love that uh, we're still friends for life. And I love that we're still in the same ministry together, that we're co-laborers. And I love that God is doing something. I love that. And so before we, after the service is over, Keith is gonna be at the back with Christine. And let me just say this. You, you know Keith publicly, and he's pretty much the same all the time, which is good or bad, depending on how you do. Depending on the day. Um, but Keith is the way he is because when he got saved, the Holy Spirit moved into his life. He has valued the word of God. He has valued the people of God. And all those things, I mean, uh, if, when you find a person who is being used by God and has been changed, you find two things, typically. You find the Holy Spirit working through his word, and you find a good woman. Christine, uh, Keith is who he is, in part, because of how Christine lives her life. Exactly right. And so, um, after service, they're going to be back there to greet people. But Keith, you know, you, uh, you have the SCMD process, something you believe in, you live out, you minister through and to, yeah. and it changed your life. Why don't you share how that happened? Well, first of all, um, Christy won't be back there. Oh. Uh, that's, you didn't know that. She's upstairs doing, she's worked in kids ministry for 19 years, and that's where she is at this service. So that being said, um, I'm going to share my story. Uh, Jim and I talked about this uh, earlier this week, and tie parts of my story to share, connect, minister, disciple. And, I, and as I share this, you're going to hear names, because names are important. Because any of us that are a disciple of Jesus, and as any of us grow, there are other people involved. That's, that's God's design. That's what Jesus modeled. There were people involved. If you look at Timothy, Paul was involved. And you, as you and I read through Scripture, there's always people involved in, their, in connection. And in that connection, there's ups and downs. So whatever the story is, there are ups and downs. Just know that. What sets us apart as disciples of Jesus, one of the things that sets us apart is how we deal with our ups and downs in relationship with each other. If you've been married for more than a month, <laughs> it, it, it just, it, you know, it, it's not easy. But the, the scripture tells us, and Jesus says this to his disciples, he goes, a new command I give you, as I have loved you, so love one another. By this the world will know you're my disciples because of your love for one another. It's the hardest thing we'll ever do, but we're gonna do it. And so that whole, we'll go back to share, connect, minister, disciple. So let me share the share part. And I can think back early on, 
Uh, there's there's uh, three, four people I'll talk about. There's even more, but the, the ones that stand out. First is my grandma. And you guys have heard me talk about her. I call her Sissy. Um, she's 100 years old. She'll be 101 December. Um, lives up in Gordon, Nebraska. And that's like four and a half, five hours from where I live. And, uh, but she, ever since I was a little boy, I knew about Jesus because she always told me about Jesus and my brother and my sister. And, and uh, she's always prayed for me. So then in my younger years, and I, I moved, I lived in different families growing up, I kind of in and out of things. And then through my high school years, weren't favorable, but she always prayed for me. So I don't know who's sitting out there right now that has a, a, a son or a daughter or a grandson or granddaughter that's far off or a husband or a wife that's far off. Here, Jim talked about earlier, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation as though God were making his appeal through us. We've been given, we're, we're a royal priesthood. So priests intercede on behalf of other people before God. Be, don't give up praying for the ones you love. And uh, my grandma never gave up praying for me or any of us. And so that's one of the share. I knew about Jesus Christ. And even when I was running hard the wrong way, I knew that I was going to hell. I knew Jesus was coming back. I just wasn't going because the, her input in my life. So I always knew about God. I just did my own thing anyway. I don't advise that. So then there was a gentleman named, named Tim Hutz. And I lived with his family for several years. And, and, and Tim was more of a doer than a, a, a talker. And he lived a life of humility and patience and kindness and generosity. And so I always saw Jesus in him. And then I think of Buddy Neville and Schofield, met them when I was in the military, and how they shared Jesus and how they shared their life and how to be a husband and wife. And so I had that. So that's the share. And because I was shared with, share, connect, Jesus shared who he was and he connected people in relationship with him and with other people, I came to a point in my life because I was shared with that I connected with Jesus and I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ when I was 19. And part of that connection is, is belief, but it's in the receiving or surrendering to Jesus, repentance, one of my favorite words in the whole Bible, it's the second best thing God ever gave us, next to salvation, is the, the ability to repent, to have a change of heart towards him and to align with God, a change of heart and a change of mind. Repentance and then identifying, connecting with Christ in baptism. Buried with Christ, I love, raised to walk in new life. And so when, and then Jim said it earlier, so when we surrender to Jesus, we are given the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, to guarantee, a deposit, guarantee to us. It says that in Ephesians chapter one. Share, connect. And so part of the connection, I think of also the connecting with Jesus, but then the design is that we would connect with other people as his church. So I'm going to tell you a little bit. Of, some of you know this story. You've heard it before. Some of you haven't. I like to hear it. It's my own story. And here, uh, and this is important. This is why I like my own story. My story is so redemptive. It's so redemptive. And it's so good, not because just I'm, like I'm so good, but it's good to think about your story and know your story because there are days when I don't feel like any of this is true and I go back to my story. And I think about the people and I, I, I go back to what God has done and what I've learned from God in his word and what's true. So our stories are important. So please know your story for your sake and others. So I'm going to pick up my story. I told you, I, got, I surrendered to Christ. I got saved when I was 19. Military, married, uh, we had kids. We moved to northern Idaho in uh, the summer of 2003, June 2003. And we came to this church in July of 2003, whatever, it was the second service in this building. And we pulled out in the parking lot, we came in, there was no pavement out there, it was all dirty, put the kids in kids' church, and I sat right back there in the corner so I could get out as fast as I got in. I didn't want anybody touching me or hugging me, and I saw that stuff going on, so I scooted right in there. And uh, they were singing church songs, and I'm telling you, I love Jesus. I didn't know to love his church. I never saw a whole lot in church. And this is my junk. I'm not blaming the church. I, I'm not a church critic. That's too easy. Anybody can be a critic. I want to be part of the solution. And, uh, but then, back in the day, I didn't care about church. And so I'm sitting back there and I did music, baptized. I remember there were 14 baptisms in that particular service. And uh, Jim Putman comes out. Don't know who he is. There's a music stand up here. And here's what he said. I remember it like it was yesterday. He goes, you guys are freaks. He goes, it's hot outside, it's hot in here, our air conditioner's already broken, 
this is the second service, you know, second week in this building. And he said, but we don't, we didn't, we're not called to go to church for our comfort. We're not called to go to church. We're called to be the church. I cry easy now. I'm a baby. I didn't cry ever back then. I had a hard heart and I made a, a vow not to ever cry. So I just didn't do it. When he said that, it was one of the most true things I ever heard. And I knew it was true down to my guts. I started weeping back there. I'd never heard it. We're not called to go to church. We're called to be the church. Because I tried most of my life to be a good Christian, and I was terrible at it. And then, I, uh, then he said this, and he goes, and the reason it's so full in here is you guys are disciples and disciple makers wherever you go. Your disciples at home, your disciples when you're at the grocery store, your disciples at school, at work, and you're inviting people into your homes, into your life, and you're inviting them to your church. And if you're sitting out there right now and you're not in, that, and you're not in the game, you're not doing that, go find another church. We need the room. <laughs> and I'm like, huh. I didn't know if I necessarily believed everything, but at least they did, and they had a vision and a mission. And he goes, by the way, the, the, the vision is we exist to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. I'm like, that's pretty lofty. And, uh, and our mission is we're going to create biblical disciples in a relational environment. And the definition of a disciple, Matthew 4, 19. And he said, Jesus said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. A disciple is one who's committed to following Jesus. That means following him, going where he goes, stopping when he stops. One who's committed to being changed by Jesus. That's transformation as we spend time with Jesus and God's people. He changes the things in us that we don't know how to change and don't want to sometimes. And we're committed to his mission. We're going to love what Jesus loves. We're going to value what Jesus values, and it changes our life. So that's what a disciple is. I didn't know what a disciple was. I thought a disciple was the guys in the Bible. I was just a Christian trying to do good enough then, and I knew I wasn't. So I lived a free, angry, defeated Christian life. So go to that service, come back the next week, and uh, walk in the door. And Greg Turbin, back then, those of you who know Greg, he was the uh, connections pastor, and he walks up, shakes my hand. I'm with Christine. And he goes, hey, my name's Greg. And I go, hey, Greg. And he goes, I want you to meet somebody. And I said, okay. This is Chris and Becky Wagner. They live up the road from you. I'm like, how do you know where I live? <laughs> I moved here to get away from people. It was one of the reasons I moved to Idaho. <laughs> I said, how do you know where I live? And uh, I live north, way north of here. And he goes, well, you filled out a card. And I go, I don't fill out cards. And my wife said, honey, I filled out the card. <laughs> And so he introduced me to Chris and Becky Wagner. He goes, this is, who, this is your home group leader. He didn't ask me if I was interested in being a home group. He goes, this is your home group leader. I'm like, so Chris, he's like, we should go. So we go. And uh, got to know Chris and Be Becky Wagner well. And we didn't, I want you to hear this. We didn't just meet in group. We became friends outside a group. We went through things together and the other people in the group. And then as it grew, so that's the share. That, now I'm in the connect part. Also, a young man named Aaron Klo, who used to be on our staff, he invited me, he, because I, I'm pretty good at coffee in all, in all its various forms, and we, they got an espresso machine, so I was one of the very first baristas we had here. And I served there, and that was a connection point, because I knew I could serve there, and I didn't have to do ministry stuff. I didn't have to work with people, I could just make them coffee. Share, connect. So I'm getting connected, and I look at the, 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 these different things that are going on. And, and the whole time, I want you guys to hear this, that there's people involved. The Spirit of God is at work in each of us as we give way, as we yield to these things that God has for us. So it's God working in us as we interact with each other, we encourage, and it's God working in them. So then minister. Share, connect, train to be minister. I, I've never done ministry per se, and... Uh, and so I'm in, a, I'm in a, a life group, and uh, Chris Wagner's like, we're going to branch. Would you be a host home? I'm like, yeah, we can do a home group in my, a life group in my house. We did that. Well, Greg Turbin, again, here he is in the picture. He was my community pastor. And, and then the coach in our community was a gentleman named Cliff Hall, who was very instrumental in my life, both of those men. And on top of that, Greg had invited me into his men's group. And he's a pastor, so I'm now I'm in his men's group, and he's letting me in on what his life's like, his marriage, his kids, his frustrations, the things that are going well. And he's just a guy. He's just a guy. He's not some hoity-toity pastor. He's like a real guy who cares about Jesus, and it was very appealing to me. And uh, then we needed a branch again, and, and Greg said, I need you to be my apprentice in a home group. I'm like, yeah, I'm, no, you're going to do it. You're going to be fine. 
And then I was a home group leader. There's a process that goes on. And I didn't want to be a home group leader because I didn't think I would do good. Does anybody ever just not do stuff because you think you'll stink at it? Well, you will. <laughs> I'm telling you, nobody starts doing anything good. You got to stink at it for a while. You just got to do it. And I did. And so, but, but I had people come alongside me. Cliff would help me. Uh, uh, Greg Turbin would help me. I'd call Chris Wagner. I got to be friends with, I could just go down lists of names. Well, then I end up being a coach. In that whole process of, of, of minister, being a life group leader, a, a coach, um, Jim called me and said, hey, I'd like to have uh, lunch with you and Christine. And I'd like to meet you. So it was Jim and Lori. It was uh, Christy and I, we met in Rathdrum, and I got there first. They pulled up in separate vehicles, and I could tell they weren't getting along. I, I, I'm pretty intuitive. I, I pick up the vibes, and, uh, and so we went and sat down, and Jim and Lori were across from Christy and I, and Jim just said, hey, guys, you just need to know, Lori and I have been fighting all morning, and haven't we, Lori? And she's like, yeah, we have Jim, and so it, it was obvious, and he goes, but we want to put that aside for now. We just want to get that out of the way, and here's why we're meeting. And in my mind right there, I'm like, I'll follow that right now. It was called authenticity. I mean, the senior pastor of a big wonkin' mega church fights with his wife, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> fights with other people, too. And, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, we ha we've had our we've days. We've had our days. And, 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 so, and so it was in that process, and Jim challenged me um, to consider ministry at, at a higher level. And he goes, why don't you start with being pastor of the day? And that, that's working in benevolence and coming in. Because I worked out of my home. I had a pretty liberal schedule. And so I started coming and doing that. And he introduced me to a guy named Jeff Smith. Who taught me how to sit down with people, listen to their problems, find out where they were, help them with their needs, help get them connected. When they come in, they just don't get food to eat and money and help. We help connect them into relationship with Jesus and with other people. Well, in that process, uh, I'd been doing that for a while. And Lydia Grubb had me go upstairs and visit Jim. And Jim, in that uh, conversation asked me to come on staff as real life men pastor, men's pastor. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to work in a church. i um, never done that before. And I was, honestly, I was scared to death. I'm like, I had a good job, made good money, um, had my own time. About 11, it was, it was 11 months later, I said yes. There was a series of events, and I came on staff. So here I'm in the minister phase of my life, learning to be a minister. Never worked in a church before. Don't have a Bible school certificate. I'm not knocking Bible school. I just didn't have that stuff. So I'm pretty unqualified and a big church full of men. I don't even know how to preach. And now I'm the men's pastor. And I learned a lot of lessons. And the people who were involved in that would be Jim Putman, would be Brandon Gindin as I grew in men's ministry, Jim Blazin, Bill Krause, Dan Lynch, Charlie Couch. I can just go down the list of men that come alongside of me. There's a lot more. So if I leave your name, I just know I love you anyway. You know who you are. Well, in that, so I was a men's pastor. Then, through that whole process, I became the thrift store pastor. I did that for a while. Worked under Lex, Rex Lata. Still growing in ministry. And a lot of these transitions weren't easy. And sometimes they were downright hard. But you know what? A disciple is made for hardship and adversity. That's what makes us great as, as we endure. That's one thing God gives us the ability to endure things, even if I don't like it. Thrift store pastor. And then Jim, I remember Jim came up to me one day and he's like, uh, hey, I want you to do um, announcements or hosting this week. And I'm like, uh, no, nah, I'm good. And he goes, no, you're going to do it. I go, I don't want to. He goes, I don't care. This is how our conversations have often gone. And it's one thing I've always loved about you, Jim, because part of why I say I don't care, if, if you really want me to do it, you'll, you'll earn it. And sometimes people go, okay. And I'm like, you didn't really want me to do it. Yeah, he made me do it. And so I came up on the stage. It's a Friday night service. Froze and said, I don't know what I'm doing up here, and I walked off. <laughs> Jim pushed me back up. I get I get through the I get through the stuff. I'm just dying inside. I go, I'm ready to go off. Jim's coming up, he brings me up here with him. And I want you guys to hear this. This is super important. I want you to think minister, being prepared, being equipped. And Jim goes, Hey, this is Keith's first time up here. Didn't he do a great job? Yeah, that's about how the clapping was. That's exactly right, because I didn't do a great job. Here's what he said, and this is where you play, I want you guys to hear this, you play a part in tr equipping people to minister. He goes, thank you for being a church that raises up our future preachers, 
church planters and senior pastors. And you make sure before you go home, you find Keith and tell him how much you appreciate him trying. He didn't say how good a job he did, but that he tried. And that's all we can do at first is to try. And so since that time, this is where I get emotional. You guys have always treated me wonderful. You have always loved me and encouraged me. And so thank you for that. So that was part of the deal. Going through ordination. Again, Dan Lynch. Dan Lynch, if you're in here, huge, significant part of my life. Then I worked in the church training development team under Luke Yetter. Luke has had a significant impact on my life as a disciple and as a leader. And then I was a community pastor. I've done a few things here. And I, and I worked under Evan Meske, one of my closest friends. And as I learned how to preach, there were guys that were involved in that. Again, Evan Meske is one of them. Bill Krause, Craig Miles, Jim Putman. This is all because people have invested in me, whether they like me or not sometimes. And uh, my, the, my last role here was connections. I was a connections pastor, new believers, baptisms, did a few baptisms here, membership. And then back in September, 21, um, you know, before I even get into that, I'd been told oftentimes by Jim, he's like, Keith, I think you should plant a church. Or somebody say, I think you should be a lead pastor of a church. Or I think you... And I always heard this, and in September of, of last year, um, I talked to Jim, and I stepped down from staff. I still stayed here, and I wanted to take three to four months to go, Lord, what's the next step? Because I didn't have a plan. didn't have a job. didn't have anything. Actually, it ended up being five months, and um, where the Lord directed Christine and I is I'm lead pastor at Parkview Church in Lexington, Nebraska, and I've um, been there for two months. Amazing people that I love dearly. So if you guys are watching, I love you and miss you. I also miss you guys. So I want to thank you for choosing to not be critics and choosing to raise me up as a pastor, as a preacher as a minister of the gospel. Jim, I want to thank you for the opportunities you've given me. And thank you for even when it's not easy and the things you and I have gone through. Thank you for being the church. And who benefits from that, and that, this is going to sound arrogant, but anybody I get to be around because I learned to be a disciple and disciple maker here. And, I'm, and if I never worked in a church again, I'm still going to make disciples. I'm still going to have men's groups. I'm still going to do life in a, in, a, in a small group of some sort. And I'm still going to invest my life in people. You don't have to work in a church to do that. So thank you for being in the church. I love you guys. I'm so thankful to see you. And thanks for listening. <laughs> couple, of, couple of things I want to I point out. Um, as you go through the process, as, as Keith started to become just a, an other-centered servant who went where... God directed him to go even when he was uncomfortable. He began to make disciples in small groups. And he was living out the kind of Christian life he and Christine were that we think every Christian needs to live out. And again, that doesn't mean perfect. It means sincere heart, walking humbly before God, walking with other people. And he became more and more intentional. He was able to make disciples. And, and not everybody is called to a full-time ministry position. Very few are. Um, when, what I mean by full-time ministry position, I mean paid. Everybody's called to a full-time ministry position. That's right. Wherever you work, live, and play. But God has called some people to that, and, and he makes you aware of that through other people. Uh, it was m people investing in me and speaking life into me. I didn't think, I thought I was disqualified because of all my, my mistakes and my addictions and things that I'd had to work through, even though I was walking with Jesus and was changed in many ways, I still thought all those things were check marks against me being used. Mm -hmm. Instead, those were shaping me for the ministry that I would have as a, a unpaid person, as a part of the church, but then later on as a pastor. I was discipled in the same way that Keith was. And as I, I think about this, every one of you is called to take the next step to be obedient to Jesus. You don't, you don't get to be with Jesus and stay where you are. 
That's right. Now, here's what I mean by that. When Jesus came to his disciples, he said, come and follow me. And some said no. Some said, no, I'll just be here next time you come by. Do I get to call you a disciple? Uh, are you my disciple maker, my rabbi? And Jesus would have said, no. No, you don't. You're not actually a disciple. You may come to an event that I do. You may come and, and to, to a healing sort of thing. But as far as disciples, no, you don't get to change the definition of the word because I show up to be entertained and to be healed, but I don't have to follow you. All of us are called to be disciples who make disciples, to learn how to do that. Doesn't, it just does, you don't hand out a Bible and somehow figure that out. If that were true, that Jesus would have said, hey, I'm going to show you how to make a printing press. Let's, let's start printing out Bibles and handing them out. He said, no, I'm going to give you the word and you go and make disciples with the word. It's God's spirit, God's word, and God's people. And it takes people who are willing to submit themselves and to learn to be taught all that Jesus has commanded. That's how it's done. And so that is a call for every one of us. Maybe today you're, you're here for the first time and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've either, you've either never said yes to him or maybe you said yes in a prayer or baptism but you have never really surrendered. Or maybe somebody else said yes for you when you were a baby and somehow that makes you a Christian because somebody else baptized you as a baby in a, one denomination or another. No, I'm sorry. Baptism is for those who repent and believe. Now you can, I mean, it's a dedication. It's great. Parents dedicating themselves to raising their children, but that child has to make a decision. You're saved by grace through faith. God so loved the world he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes has eternal life. It's time for you maybe to surrender, and we want you to, and here's the deal. Yes, you're gonna serve Jesus, but we all serve something. That's right. And if it isn't Jesus, you're serving something far less. He's amazing, awesome. Does he take you to some hard places? Yep, but he goes there with you, and he has eternal life for you. He can change your life. He wants you no matter what you've done. Take the next step today. Text us through the, the, the I, or through the, uh, um, whatever it is. Or just come talk to us. Or come talk to us. We want to talk to you. Why wait another day? Some of you may have, uh, you may have had a love for Jesus the way Keith did, but, but uh, you know, you never got connected really into a church because Maybe somebody didn't show you that, or maybe it had hurt you, and that's why he comes in, and thank, thank God for Christine, who's like, no, I want to go there, and Keith's like, oh, okay, and, and, uh, and he comes, and, and it was through that process where he got connected with people that love him, and were loved by him. It's, it, this wasn't all changing Keith. Keith changed us, too. It made us better. And uh, it's in those connections. Some of you haven't gotten connected. I don't have time or uh, I'm busy or listen, connection, they were devoted in Acts 2. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. You had to be devoted to the, the characteristics, the qualities of fellowship, time, surrender, openness, honesty. You've got to make that your choice. And it's scary, especially if you've been hurt by people. We're all busy, but so often we're busy chasing the wrong things that are going to lead to empty things. Some of you need to decide to get connected. You all need to if you haven't. Some of you are in connect groups and you're growing and, and you're like, wow, my heart's changing and I, I want to serve. And, and yes, you become a servant at work instead of a dictator as a boss. Yeah, you got to lead, but leadership lead looks like laying down your life and you're, gonna, you're starting to become a minister and care for the people around you. Yeah, as a dad, you don't just provide stuff. You're, you're starting to understand you care about the hearts of your children and your wife. Mm -hmm. You care and you're a minister and, and you don't just do the dishes because you get something out of it. Right? You start to care about the people. You're, you're more like Jesus who 
laid down his life and you're ministering. And as a church, you recognize there's some parts of ministry that you were given the ability to do that, that, that means you have to do that a part of the church. We have so many people in this church that are serving in children's ministry, youth ministry, going to camp on their vacation for youth ministry to serve those kids because we're going to invest in them before they get too far out there in this crazy world. They're serving in lifelines. They're serving in the worship arts team, in recovery. They're, they're host homing. They're, you name it, they're serving. His wife's been serving in children's ministry for 19 years. Okay? They're, they're invested. We serve. Some of you, though, you, you've been a servant, but you don't necessarily know how to be intentional about discipling somebody else. Well, the more time you, you waste not making some decisions to learn that, it, it, you don't just learn that over time, you learn that intentionally. And so we've got classes all summer. We've got classes all the time during the services that uh, we'll give you a CD to listen to the sermon or go to the app and, and to listen to the sermon. You might need to go to a class for a little while to learn some intentionality in your, with your kids, in your marriage, in, in your job, in disciple making. But this is what we learn how to do. Our responsibility is to equip people, but people have to decide to be equipped. I pray that you take the next step. Well, we're going to take communion in a minute. And uh, Keith, I'm proud of you. I love you. I'm glad we got Zoom calls now. Um, yeah. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are, who you choose. You, you chose just regular, everyday people, and you invested in them, and and Lord, I'm glad that we don't have to be the heroes. We don't point to ourselves. We point to you. Right. Every bit of what Keith did is scriptural. And he chose to be obedient to you. And you did things with him that were hard, but were good. And he is living a meaningful life. And we, he wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done what I did had you not empowered us and come for us. You're the hero of the story. That's right. We're not pointing to us. We're pointing to you. Thank you for allowing us to do it. Thank you for this time together, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We will be continuing communion and finishing our service in just a moment. We pray today's service was challenging, encouraging, and motivational. We hope you'll visit one of our campuses soon. We'd love to meet you in person and give you and your family a small gift of appreciation. For more information about real life, upcoming events, and connecting with our community, please visit reallifeministries.com. Come join us and help us impact our community, our nation, and the world for Jesus, one person at a time. That's what communion does. It calls us to remember. And I love today because this gives us occasion for ourselves to look back at the people who've been an impact in our lives. Even as Keith was talking, I'm thinking, I know the equivalent people in my life. I can think of people who, as I was struggling through drug addiction, stood by me, my parents, people who stuck by my side and showed me what unconditional love looks like, people who, youth ministers and people throughout my life. Maybe you can do that too. You think back to what God has saved you from. And it was him, it was his Holy Spirit drawing and his Holy Spirit mobilizing people to care for you and to love you and to show you that you are loved. It's a beautiful thing that as we take communion, we get to think back to the first person who ever demonstrated that love, Jesus. Romans five says that he showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. So while there are an amazing group of people that have poured their lives into you, there is no one who has done more and no one who has cared more than him. And communion just calls us to remember and celebrate the fact that he is so good, he is so loving, he is so worthy of our praise. And as we take communion together, 
uh, we always want to just prepare our hearts and not come in a flippant manner, but be able to think back and truly think, gosh, where have I been? What have I done? And what has he done to save me? And so for a little bit, let's just take some time, prepare our hearts, uh, pray, and uh, in a moment we'll take communion together. Let's prepare our hearts. As we're praying, we want to also pray for those around us and in our community who are lost and who are hurting. In a room this size, there are people that we are aware of who are grieving right now, who need hope right now. Maybe it's us, but let's just take some time to pray for them by name. People who we know need to encounter the loving hope that Jesus provides. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 remembers the night before Jesus went to the cross. On the night he was betrayed, he gathered his disciples and they took part in what believers for the last 2,000 years have done and we're uniting with them. As Jesus was gathering with his disciples, they had a meal and they took bread and Jesus, as they were passing it around, said, this is my body given for you. So let's take the bread in remembrance of him. And they passed a cup around and Jesus said, this is a sign of the new covenant signifying freedom. So let's take this cup in remembrance of him. Lord, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful that you initiate love, that you took a step towards us when we didn't deserve it when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, that you took a step. And as we live now, I pray that we would be marked by the life that you purchased for us. One that is secure, one that is at peace, and one that is on mission to be ambassadors for you in this world and people who are making disciples in our families, in our workplaces, in our community. And I pray that those areas would feel the echoes of what you've done in our life. We're thankful that we don't serve a, a dead God, that you didn't stay in the grave, but that you rose and you purchased victory. And as we walk in that, I pray your blessing on us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna take some time right now just to respond to God. There's a couple ways this could look. You might be able to come up and ask for prayer. We'll have some team members up front. If, if there's something you need prayer for, uh, or if maybe you want to get more information, how do I put my faith in Jesus? We want to talk about that and pray with you. Uh, maybe you just need to sit and do some business with God. But uh, for all of us, uh, I think this is an appropriate occasion for us to worship. So let's stand to our feet and uh, celebrate our great King.
heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living hope
fortress. You're my fortress. You're my hiding place. You're the shelter where I am safe. You have freed me. And you have called me by name. You're my redeemer, my saving. Amazing. And what a special time together, opening God's word and worshiping our great God. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you were spurred forward. I would just encourage you to take a step. You know, Jim was talking about what it means to actually put this into practice. And Keith is an example of what that can look like. And I would just say that I think all of us have something to do, whether it be joining a life group or maybe you've been in one. It's like, all right, I know, I hear you, God. It's time to lead one. It's time to host one. It's time to join a team. Whatever that looks like, take a step from here. And I really do believe God is gonna not only move in you, but uh, through you into other people's lives as we put this into practice. Uh, And as you leave today, just a reminder, stop by the kiosk out in the lobby uh, and let's uh, be generous. Let's send some kids to camp. And I would love, today we were at 12% of that goal. I would love, let's make it a goal. What do you think, like 50%? You think we could get there today? Uh huh. I, I have such little faith. She goes 100. We'll split the difference. Let's say 75. Okay. <laughs> Stop by there. Let's pray before we go. God, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful that as we are in your presence, you transform us. And I pray that you would continue to just breathe life on this place. I pray that our marriages, our homes, our kids, our workplaces would be uh, better and more God glorifying because of the time today. And uh, as we put this into practice, we pray you would bless our steps in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.